I'm here this afternoon with Reverend Dr. David Trawick, the senior pastor of Northwest Hills United Methodist Church here in San Antonio. And I understand you had a, well, when 9-11 happened, you had a special interest begin to build and of study. I'll let you pick it up there. Okay. Well, on September 11th, uh, 2001, I had just dropped off my girls uh, at high school. One was a senior, one was a freshman and uh, was on my way home uh, to get everything ready to go to the office and I was listening to the radio and heard a news report that an airplane had crashed into one of the Twin Towers in New York City uh, and they were you know pondering what that could mean perhaps somebody had, had a heart attack in the plane or something like that it seemed strange and so when I got home I turned on the television uh, and as I was watching on television I saw the second plane hit the ta uh, second tower uh, and at that point, everybody knew that this was not an accident, that this was an intentional act. And uh, it very quickly came out that, of course, it was um, Muslim men uh, from the Middle East who were responsible for this. And I realized at that point that I did not know a lot about Islam. Um, I had, had seen enough going on in the news before, uh, various Muslims who were carrying out acts of terror of different kinds. and usually claiming it was in the name of Allah. Uh, and I didn't understand how that could be. And so I decided I needed to learn more about this religion. All I knew at that point was their five pillars, um, five standard practices of the faith. Uh, so the first thing I did was go to the used bookstore and buy a Quran uh, and began to read. Uh, and uh, it was at first um, dull, uh, confusing, uh, I found there was not a storyline in it, and as I got further into the book, I began to find verses and whole passages that were concerning uh, in terms of the kinds of values and actions it was advocating. Uh, and the more I read, the more concerned I became, realizing that the, the hijackers were doing what they thought their faith had actually commanded them to do, what their God had commanded them to do. Uh, and I realized I needed more information than just reading the Quran. I mean, I made my way through it a couple of times and marked it up pretty good. But then I began to read uh, from other writers about the Quran and the background and some of the traditions known as the Hadiths, the um, authoritative traditions of the life and teachings of Muhammad. And uh, I read some by Muslims, uh, Muslim apologists, Muslim scholars. I read some by non-Muslims who were writing about Islam. Uh, some seemed to be advocates, others seemed to be pretty harsh critics. Uh, and the more I read, it was kind of um, giving me more reason for concern. Um, and uh, I realized if I had such little understanding of what Islam was all about, I figured most of our population was in pretty much the same boat, uh, and my congregation would be similarly uh, ignorant of what, uh, what Islam was all about. <clears throat> and uh, after um, a period of several years of reading and study, uh, in the midst of all the other reading and study that I do, I uh, felt like I had enough information that I could begin to educate my congregation. Uh, one of the things I did early on uh, was uh, a sermon that addressed Islam. I did it in the context of a series of sermons addressing what our neighbors believe. We have a Mormon stake right behind us and so laid out um, a little bit of the Mormon faith and how it's similar and how it's different. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses Church up the street from us and uh, talked about what they believe and how it's different and some similarities to what we believe uh, and laid out Islam. Uh, and um, the response was instructive to me, uh, that this was all new information to our congregation, that nobody had a clue that such things were in the Quran. They'd heard of it, no one had ever looked in one. Um, it was not too awfully long after that that I had requests from folks in the congregation for more education about this. Uh, and since I had been continuing my own study, I knew that there was, I could put together a, a fairly good series of, of lessons, uh, which ended up being about 10 or 12 lessons that I taught uh, that covered 
the life of Muhammad, the early history, some, some later history, nothing ex, uh, uh, exhaustive of Islam, um, some of their theological developments, uh, specifically focusing in on particular lessons on jihad, uh, what the Quran says about women, uh, and some other things like that, uh, and a section on what uh, the Quran says about Christians and Jews. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting to see the response. I uh, had probably 35 people come the first time. Uh, I did it again a few years later and had 40, 45. Uh, this last year I taught it again, I had 90. Uh, with all the things that have been going on recently, the, the uh, interest level was quite high. And I actually had people coming from oh, 30 miles away on the other side of town because wow. this was the only place they knew anything like this was going on. Well, you're here in San Antonio, and I understand that there's numerous mosques that have been built here. So, um, is that stimulating some of the interest of the community? Actually, there has not been a lot of development over in this part of town. Uh, there was a Muslim school that came up not far from here. Uh, I don't know what happened, but they disappeared uh, after a year or so. Uh, the building's being used for something else, and we've not seen anything else go up. Um, so that hasn't been anything that's particularly stirred the folks in our congregation. Uh, although they are aware of developments taking place in, the, in our own country um, in terms of some places where Sharia law has been used in family courts. Uh, and in fact, here in Texas, they've got the American Law for American Courts um, bill going through the, the uh, Texas Senate and House right now. Um, and we've got folks who are aware that you know some cities like Dearborn, Michigan have a sizable population of Muslims in such a way that they're really able to carry out their own culture and their own courts within certain neighborhoods where you know other people are really not welcome. So they're aware that those things are developing in some parts of the country, but but there's not been any concern in terms of what we've seen here in San Antonio. Um, uh, to my knowledge, there have not been any problems between the Muslim population and the non-Muslim population. Um, and like I say, in our part of town, we've not seen mosques pop up over here. I do know there are some around, but not in this, this edge of town. You, it's obvious that the interest has grown from the very first time, well, it's basically tripled by the time you did your third mm -hmm. um, series on it. Um, what particular areas were their interest? What, what particular were they drawn to, to learn about? Mm. Um, the two areas in particular, I would say, I mean, the, the two hot topics yeah. would probably be jihad and what the Quran says about women and the treatment of women. Um, and when you think about our society and what's going on in the news today, it's natural that those would be the two big ones that folks would be most interested in. Um, the rest of it kind of provides a historical and theological framework for what's going on. Um, but uh, those would be the two primary areas of highest interest among our folks. Iran, I understand that back in the 60s and 70s was pretty much a Western type of culture and mm -hmm. now it has forced its citizens into um, being ruled by the Islam as being a statewide yes. ruling of their government. So it would greatly impact the women. So can you elaborate on some of the differences between Western culture and what the Quran says about women? Um, some of it, some of the difference comes directly from the Quran, but that really lays a foundation for a broader teaching that comes out in Sharia law. That's not all directly from the Quran. But the Quran lays the foundation that women are, um, the Quran and the Hadiths, I should say, uh, together lay the foundation that women are spiritually inferior to men. Uh, there's a teaching that uh, a woman coming into the presence of a man while he's in prayer nullifies his prayer. Um, there, are, uh, there are comments by Muhammad, I think it's in the Hadiths, that he, uh, Allah had given him a glimpse into hell and most of the inhabitants there were women. 
um, a variety of kinds of things like that that really denigrate the spiritual value of women. Um, although, interestingly, I, I have read that um, some of the rules and regulations that Muhammad gave for the treatment of women were actually a step up from the polytheistic culture that surrounded them at the time in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the, the problem is uh, those rules and regulations are kind of frozen and are still carried out today, and it's regressive compared to today's world. So, for instance, a, uh, a woman uh, can inherit from her father, but only half of what a son might inherit. Uh, a woman's testimony in court uh, is equal to half the weight of a man's testimony in court. Um, things like that, which in that time, when they were first uttered, were a step up for women. Wow. But the Quran and the, those teachings are understood the, the words of and will of Allah for all times and places. And so today, it's regressive uh, for women. Um, now, what, what comes from those kinds of foundations in Sharia is that women are restricted in all sorts of activities. Typically, uh, it's not carried out in all Muslim countries, but in some countries, women are not to go out in public unless they're accompanied by their husband or another male relative. Um, they are not to drive. Uh, they are to be driven by a man in a car. Uh, they are, of course, to be covered. Uh, there are a variety of different kinds of garments, but basically it's definitely to cover your whole body with something that shows nothing of your shape. Uh, at least cover your hair and in some places cover your face with only a slit for your eyes. Um, that varies from country to country, but it's always a matter of covering up uh, the woman's uh, identity and sexuality. Wow. I also know that, in, is it under Sharia law where they uh, talk about uh, female mutilation and things like that? Is that in the Sharia law or That's, does that fall? Uh, I have read differing opinions on that. Uh, I do know that there are multiple cultures and even people of other religion, polytheistic religion, native religions of Africa that practice that. Uh, there are some Muslim countries where genital mutilation is not as prevalent as in others, uh, but it is fairly widespread. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with a mindset of uh, desexualizing a woman so that she's not as interested in sex as a man is, uh, which with the underlying assumption that that will make her more faithful to her husband. So that's that's what's behind the genital mutilation. It's not in the Quran, it's not in the Hadiths, but it is a part of the culture over there uh, and um, although it's not in their scriptural sources, many Muslim men do declare that it's the will of Allah that it be done that way. Wow. After doing all of that study, what do you what do you feel is the most important that uh, the American culture and people understand about the Muslim faith mm -hmm. and uh, culture that goes with it? Yeah. It's for me it's really kind of a two-pronged approach and that is on the one hand to understand that if Muslims know and understand and believe their scripture that book is a dangerous book. Uh, it leads to what we see going on with jihad and with the oppression of women in their cultures. Uh, it's also important for us to realize though on the other side of that there are many 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 people perhaps as many as 50 percent of all people who call themselves Muslim who have no idea what it, the content of the Quran is. Uh, they practice the five pillars, the rituals. Uh, they, many of them have been taught to recite the Quran in Arabic because that's the language that Allah speaks. Um, but they don't understand what they're reciting. So they don't know the contents of their book. Um, which always makes me wonder about how many people sitting in the pew of the church really have no idea the content of our book. Uh, but I have, I have recently read uh, testimonies of some folks who were raised just that way. Muslim nations, Muslim cultures, Muslim religion practiced in their home, 
But when they finally got a hold of a Quran that they could read and understand, they were horrified by what they found. And they left the faith. Interesting. Interesting. So, you know, if, if somebody reads it and finds out what's really in there, they, they really only have a couple of options. They can be horrified and leave their faith. Although if you're living in a Muslim country, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Many of these people wrote pseudonymously. Um, or believe it. And if you believe it, you're supposed to do it. Um, which leaves us with what we have going on today. With what's going on today, as a Christian pastor here in America, and you see all the unrest and the spreading that ISIS is doing and mm -hmm. the new um, Al-Qaeda or yeah. branch of Al-Qaeda. What, what do you foresee coming or happening? I think this is something we're going to be dealing with for the rest of our lives, which is actually what I felt as soon as I first read the Quran, uh, that this was not going to go away. This would be with us for our generation and perhaps beyond. Um, A lot of what happens in the future will depend on whether people can wake up to what's really going on and why it's going on. Um, my contention is if we can't accurately identify who the enemy is and why they're the enemy, we cannot adequately deal with them. Um, my hope, my prayer is we can get very realistic uh, about what's going on and why it's going on uh, and then respond appropriately. For the church, that means, among other things, recognizing that there's spiritual warfare going on behind the physical warfare, and that's where we can engage. Um, you know, there's a passage in Ephesians chapter 6 that talks about putting on the full armor of God to engage in spiritual warfare, uh, and it basically has to do with us growing up in our faith. Um, and if we'll really live out that character, we'll live out a kind of a life that will be attractive to other people and perhaps they will want Christ rather than turning to Islam. You said those magic words, wake up, if we wake up. How do we awaken our communities to what this really is, how it could impact our lives? Mm -hmm. I mean, what a nightmare if America one day walked through what our Iran has yeah. done over the last several decades. How do, what do you, how do you see to waking up mm -hmm. our world? I start within the church, obviously, from pastor. Uh, and part of it's educating the folks within my own church, uh, doing it in a way that is clear enough, interesting enough that they want to share it with their friends. Uh, in fact, the uh, audios of my lecture series that I've done are out on our church webpage and, and there are people all over the place. You want to get the right website? Uh, well, our church website is nwhills.org, nwhills.org. Uh, there's a link on there that can get you to those, those lessons. Um, and of course, I've engaged with Act for America uh, to help them get the word out. Uh, we can uh, get the word out through letters to the editor in our newspapers. Uh, we can do it by connecting with our uh, legislators um, and anybody else in governmental office as well uh, to try to help them see what's understand what's going on and where there's legislation that might be in the process that they need to support in terms of intelligence or defense that would relate to this particular threat uh, or within our local communities our law enforcement agencies. Uh, to offer to them uh, any kind of education that we might have to, to put out there for them and support for the work that they need to do. Have you seen in the San Antonio community uh, more Muslims uh, running for public office? Has that been an issue or anything? No, not up to this point. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I cannot recall a Muslim running for office in San Antonio at all. Um, the day will probably come, um, but I don't, I don't remember it happening yet. Nobody that I've known of, anyway. With your studies, uh, what particular has your interest now? Is there something in particular that you're keeping up with or following in your study? Um, well, let me see. The most recent 
still, well, I picked up Mark's book while I was in San Angelo uh, because he's uh, got some experience in terms of doing evangelism among Muslims, uh, which has always intrigued me and I have not found a good resource on it yet. And uh, so in fact that's next on my reading list uh, is to go through that and, and see what we might do here in San Antonio. We're, we're in a place where we'll have to go out of our way to find the Muslim community here uh, and to find them perhaps in places like the folks at Village Parkway Baptist have where they own and run a restaurant and most of their customers are, are Muslim. There might be opportunities there for us to establish relationships and in that context be able to uh, show and share the love of Christ, uh, hopefully in ways that will be enticing to them. Any, any last words, any thoughts that you'd like to share with my audience? Hmm. Big question. <laughs> Real big question. I can't think of anything. Okay. I'm blank. Well, God had a reason for leading you on the journey to begin to study and, and uh, learn about the other faith. What, uh, uh, how has that helped you in strengthening your faith? Have you seen an impact there from seeing the differences? Um, it's not that it's made my faith stronger. What's been interesting is I have had other pastors who kind of pushed against um, what I was teaching. Uh, and so, and not just Methodist pastors, but others of other brands as well. And what I have what I have put out to each one of them is, have you ever read the Quran? Don't tell me what I'm saying is wrong until you've read their book. Um, I understand completely. There are many Muslims who don't know that stuff, don't believe that stuff, are peaceful and might be great neighbors. But I know what's in their book. And what, what ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah and all those folks are doing is they're taking their book seriously and they're taking the example of Muhammad seriously. Uh, and so it's been a, a challenge, because interestingly, it, there, there are pastors around, there are Christians around, who don't take the Bible all that seriously. Even if they read it and understand what's in there, they may not take it all that seriously. And they have a hard time believing that someone might read the Quran and take it seriously and really follow the example. Uh, and so, that's provided a whole opportunity to talk about the authority of our scripture as well uh, and how we ought to respond to it. But uh, I think the, the, the Muslim fundamentalists, I don't call them extremists or radicals, I call them fundamentalists, um, may in some ways present a real challenge to Christians who don't know or understand or take seriously their book. Um, they're taking seriously theirs, we need to see what's in ours and how different it really is. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect place to wrap in that uh, Christians do need to take the Word of God seriously as the Muslims are taking their Quran seriously. Very much so. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Kat.